This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, I'm Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed, and I'm here today with Dan Willingham, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia and also the author of numerous books, uh, some of which I have here. Um, I don't know whether this is reverse chronological order, but I've got uh, The Reading Mind, uh, which is um, a cognitive approach to understanding how the mind reads, which I couldn't stop thinking about while I was reading the book. Um, and then we have, oh, this is one of my favorites. I love this one. Why don't students like school? Of course, I've been in school since my entire life, so I'm one of those people that actually likes school. And then this one, which I think is really timely, um, which is uh, when can you trust the experts, which is really addressed at a teacher audience uh, and, uh, and giving teachers the ability to evaluate technologies and proposals related to um, you know, teaching, but I think has much broader implications in today's world. And then your next book, your forthcoming book is called Outsmart Your Brain, um, which uh, we're going to have to talk about that because I, I, I eagerly anticipate its, its release. Uh, so welcome, welcome, Dan. Thanks, Greg. I'm really happy to be here. So I want to start by uh, asking a little bit on how you've become the the person that you are today. Uh, you uh, write a column uh, for the um, uh, AFT uh, newsletter, I guess, uh, which I get. Um, I'm a member of the AFT, so I, I get this. Um, and I, I was wondering, um, you know, what was that seminal event? I think you record, you mentioned it in one of your books back in 2002 yeah. or whatever, which turned you from a uh, cognitive psychologist working in general theories of learning to someone who is really, you know, kind of the, the in-house spokesman for, um, for educational psychology. How did this happen? Yeah, it is, it is uh, as you say, it was very much of, a, uh, a, of an abrupt turnabout. So um, I started my career as a uh, basic learning psychologist. I trained as a cognitive psychologist and a neuroscientist, and that's what I did for about the first 10 years of my career. Um, so I was interested in learning, but I mean, you've, you've I'm sure heard the old joke about the somebody gets a PhD and then their parents from then on introduce them as a doctor, but not the type of doctor who helps anybody. So I was a learning scientist, but not one who like would teach you how to learn anything new because I was involved in a pretty arcane little, you know, as most of us, most academics are in a pretty arcane little uh, aspect of that world. Um, but uh, despite that, I was invited to give a talk to a bunch of teachers. And it was by virtue of the fact that I was here in Charlottesville because uh, Edie Hirsch, who's famous for writing cultural literacy uh, in the mid 1980s, that book became a huge bestseller. Uh, and as he tells this story, one day he he looked to his wife and said, well, we're making all this money. Like, should we be millionaires or should we do something interesting with it? And so they started an educational foundation and it was uh, it's located here in town where uh, he at that time was still a professor. Um, and he was always fascinated by cognitive psychology. So when he was writing one of his books, he looked me up to talk with me about cognitive psychology. Several years after that, he remembered me and said, OK, uh, my organization is having our national conference in Nashville. Uh, we should have a cognitive psychologist come and talk to us about learning. So he invited me and I rashly said yes. I mean, at the, I said, like, you know, I'm, I'm not that type of psychologist. I don't know anything about classrooms or anything else. And he said, and we get that, obviously, where uh, we just think it might be interesting for the teachers to hear about learning from your perspective. So I, I said yes. And then six months later, um, realized this talk is in two weeks. Oh, my God, I've got to write this talk. What in the world am I going to say? Um, so I really panicked and um, ended up sort of getting the uh, you know, lectures that I had been giving college sophomores for by that time about a decade uh, about learning and attention and problem solving stuff. And I just sort of picked out slides that seemed kind of relevant to me and went and gave the talk. And what was funny was this, um, I had just, my wife and I had just gotten married. And so this was, uh, I, I brought her to Nashville with me. And she's a teacher. And I, the, to give you a degree of how panicked I was, half an hour before my talk, I said, don't come. Because I was so certain it was just going to be a disaster. I made her stay in the hotel room. Um, 
so I gave the talk and to my considerable surprise, uh, teachers didn't know all this content. I mean, that was my fear. It was like, what am I going to tell teachers about learning they don't already know? They didn't know this content. Um, and they actually thought it was quite interesting and, and potentially applicable to the classroom. And that that really did change my career because I thought my field is doing a terrible job of communicating with educators. And maybe that's something I could uh, I could try my hand at. So that was 2001, I guess. Um, and in the, you mentioned the American Federation of Teachers quarterly uh, called American Educator. The editor of that publication was in that audience of 500 teachers. And she said, that was really fun and interesting. Like, maybe you should do some writing for us. And I said, gosh, maybe I should. Um, and so that was uh, that was how it started. And within five years, I had completely transitioned out of basic research and was just doing translation. So from the for the profession of teaching, what, what is the relevance of of uh, theory to practice. Uh, in in your one of your books, you liken uh, teachers to doctors, right? And you know, doctors are are practitioners. They they have to they're in the business of healing, uh, uh, but they also have to study quite a bit about um, biology and and um, anatomy in, in order to be good doctors. Um, teachers also receive some training. Um, actually, professors don't, but you know, yeah. K through twelve teachers right. uh, actually do receive some some training. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, yeah, part of this training is, is theoretical and part of it is, um, you know, practice, uh, you know, so doctors are, are doctors actually are residents and interns, uh, teachers maybe sometimes go through a little bit of that. Um, but do you think that the, the practice of creating teachers is, is one that is, is too theoretical, maybe not theoretical enough, or is it theoretical, but it's the wrong theory? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and a, a, as you would imagine, I would say like super complicated, mm -hmm. um, and it, because it does get into issues of the relationship between basic science and practice, and that's one whole sort of can of worms and complication. And then the second question is, all right, even if we sort of set that aside for the moment and acknowledge it's really complicated, how are we how are we doing with that? Um, we actually have empirical data on how we're doing with that, and the answer is not all that well. So the typical way that this is uh, is measured is you look at student growth, and that of course is controversial in in terms of how that's measured. That's very frequently measured in a pretty narrow way, which is performance on standardized tests, sort of the beginning of the year, and then at the end of the year, what kind of growth has there been? But even given its limitations, you can compare on that. You know, it, it's not that crazy when you're talking about something like math. Like how much math did they learn this year? We have we can sort of measure math. Um, and if you look at teachers who've gone through traditional teacher training versus people who've gotten emergency certification, um, so they, they really haven't done very much of the coursework at all, there's not a whole lot of difference between the uh, performance of the students and the classes of those, um, those two teachers. So that's pretty concerning to, um, to uh, or uh, and probably should be more concerning to uh, state licensing boards, the people who are granting teaching licensing, we should be worried that we're not doing well enough, a good enough job. So is that because we're, we're not measuring the things that we should be measuring? Or, or do you think it's more that the, we're not teaching, you know, we're not training what we should be training? I think we can do better in training. Sir, I think the measures are limited. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But if you talk with teachers themselves, their response, sur survey after survey shows that teachers own opinion about their preparation is it was it was interesting but it was not super practical you know it didn't uh, when i got in there on that first day i felt like by the end of the week like i had learned i'm making this up now but like i think it's a common thing that i've heard from teachers um you know by the end of the first week i felt like i learned more than i had learned in my teacher prep because there's just no substitute for actually being in the classroom so they and to be clear they they kind of like it because they feel like you know, it is interesting and you're getting all this theory. Um, but uh, and they also say like very experienced teachers, you know, who've been teaching in the class like a decade or something. They'll say like now looking back now, I can kind of piece together what all that meant. And it feels like it does. It's um, uh, it, it lends a richness to my teaching. But at the time, I really needed to know you know, like classroom management's always the big one. Like, oh my God, you're really gonna leave me with all these sixth graders? You know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. 
So yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it needs to be more practical. And I've, I have written on this. And when you ask about, is it the right theory? I think one of the things that is, is a real problem is that uh, there's, there are too many theories. It's not only, it's not just that it's theoretical and it's kind of divorced from practice, but just thinking about learning. I mean, this is something, an aspect of it that I've looked at very closely, at least in terms of materials. I mean, you never I don't know exactly how teachers are being uh, prepared because that you know, professors are going to do that differently. But you can at least look at the materials that are used, the standard textbooks. And what they all do is they sort of treat future teachers like they're future researchers. They like give them an overview of the learning field. And I've argued that's that's very ineffective. All it does is make them think, well, these people have no idea of what's going on. Um, and the truth is we we have a lot of ideas about systematic ways that kids behave and where the controversy comes in is trying to come up with theories that account for that. But we could actually tell future teachers, like, if you do this, this thing is likely to happen. We don't really know why, like that's still controversial, but it's pretty predictable how kids are going to behave. And that's, um, that's the way I've argued that teacher prep could be a little less theoretical and, and of greater utility. So it's kind of like legal training. I mean, I think when you train to be a lawyer, you, you don't get the first clue about how to run a trial or, uh, you know, even sometimes, you know, draft a document of any kind. You're really kind of focused on this very theoretical stuff. Um, but um, so that's an argument in favor of more more practice. Uh, but it, what about the actually knowing what works? Um, you, when you made this analogy to medicine, you were saying that, in medicine, we, at least we have something like an FDA that will run clinical right. trials to figure out kind of what interventions are, are likely to, to work. Uh, we don't have anything like an FDA to figure out, you know, what teaching approaches uh, work. So, so how, how do we find out, right, what, what works and what doesn't work? Do we just rely on really small scale experimentation that happens in, in academia or how do, how do we, or can we, can we actually, um, use some natural experiments or, or, you know, do some observational studies based on the variety that we see in, in the American educational environment? So it's a great question. And, and it gets on, it gets to a, a, an issue that's been pretty controversial. We actually do have a what works uh, mechanism uh, through the federal government, through the Department of Education. It's called the What Works Clearinghouse. And it's meant to provide exactly what we're describing, uh, which is a impartial summary of the research literature. Um, it's, it's not had the influence that people had hoped. I think it was founded in 2007 or something like that. It hasn't had the impact that people hope. I think for a couple of reasons. One is that you, you sort of mentioned in passing, like what should it be small scale studies? Should it be larger epidemiological? I think most people would say, well, you kind of want everything in the mix. Like you want um, you know, sort of gold, they're frequently called the gold standard uh, trial that looks like a medical trial where you have random assignment and all that. But then you also want to make use of naturally occurring experiments when that happens. You want to, and you want like really small scale fine grain uh, studies of a very small number of kids, but it's really in depth. Um, you want all of that to, uh, to go into your report. And the What Works Clearinghouse has been very narrow in their definition of what sort of research should count. They're really only interested in the gold standard business. And the other thing is they only, because that's all they want, those experiments are very expensive to conduct. And so they tend to only be conducted for very widely used um, uh, uh, interventions. So they don't cover that much. And then because they only want to deal with um, RCTs, uh, they, they frequently uh, end up saying like, well, there's all these experiments, but none of those experiments count. And so they sort of not that jokingly were called the what doesn't work clearinghouse because they ended up concluding nothing, nothing really has enough evidence to even be able to judge. That's less true than it used to be. Um, but that's, you know, in principle, it's, it's a good idea to provide that sort of information. And I think I think there are some educators who consult it, but it's it's I think also something of a missed opportunity because you would like um, science to speak with sort of a unified voice, and I think it could. Well, there seem to be a lot of folk theories about kind of what you know what teaching ought to be, and uh, in in your work you've discussed some of these fads and fashions and and how they kind of rise and fall, and uh, I think. 
probably the most famous one is this, um, the Reading Wars. And uh, I wonder if you could kind of walk us through the, the, the Reading Wars, um, you know, phase one and, and phase two, and, and maybe at a higher level, explain, you know, how it is that ideas that have been demonstrably disproven or at least shown to have no evidence, they, they persist and they, and they resurge and, and they gain um, you know, prominence. How, how does that happen sort of sociologically? And I think this has implications well beyond education because you see this happen in medicine, yeah. you see this happen in all sorts of disciplines. Yeah, that's that's a very difficult, challenging topic. So, the reading wars goes back, you know, a hundred years or more, and it's it's really a fight not about reading broadly, but about how one aspect of reading is taught. What most psychologists would call decoding, not just psychologists, but what most reading experts would call decoding, uh, and that means going from print on the page to words in the mind. Uh, and what most parents would think of as a pretty straightforward process of teaching kids to sound words out. Um, this, uh, I, I mentioned this controversy goes back 100 years because the, um, uh, the, the, the counter idea has been around that, at least that long. The counter idea is, look, you, this isn't the way visual perception really works. And you're thinking about this really narrowly. When you see an elephant, you don't say, well, I see a trunk and I see some feet and there's a tail. Let me kind of piece together these parts. You just see an elephant, right? And similarly, a really good reader just sees the word dog. They don't sound it out. And so this is the way good readers do it. And so we want kids to be taught the good way to do it straight away. Um, and there's actually an example in one of the books you gave of a textbook from uh, educational psychology textbook from the uh, 50s, I think, that shows eye movement. So you see a page of text and you see little tick marks where a, a, a reader's eyes have stopped moving. Um, and if you've never, for all of you listening now, if you've never done this before, you probably have, uh, but it's really fun to watch someone's eyes while they're reading because your experience of yourself when you're reading is your eyes just sort of moving you know, smoothly across the page, but it's not like that at all. You have these little jumps called saccades and experienced readers make fewer saccades. And so this educational psychology textbook said like, this is what good readers do. So you should encourage beginning readers to make fewer saccades. So what is, of course, skipped over is like the experienced readers, probably that's not what their saccades look like when they first started. And similarly, when you first start, you don't just see dog. You do once you're very experienced. But when you're a beginning reader, you don't just see dog. You really do need to sound it out. So um, this this controversy, as I said, started like in the 1920s. It got resolved, apparently, in the mid-1960s. Carnegie Foundation decided we should settle this once and for all. They decided a woman named Jean Chawl, who is a professor at Harvard, should be the one to figure it out. She spent a year or two reviewing the entire literature and said the right way to teach children to decode is teach them letter sound correspondences. Don't try and teach them entire words at, at, at once. That, that's not gonna be effective. So everyone thought that it was gonna end at that point. But now this gets to your second question, your, uh, which is how do people sort of put together this literature? And the, the truth is reading is complicated. There are people, there are kids who come in who have lots of natural language capabilities. They've got really good vocabulary. They're really good at piecing together syntax. They're really good at hearing individual speech sounds, which turns out to be important for reading. Uh, and they need really minimal support from a teacher. These are kids who, with just a little bit of guidance, will kind of teach themselves to read. Those kids exist. There aren't many of them, but there are some. And then at their other end, there are kids who have none of that in place, and they need a whole lot more support. So every teacher is going to have some kids who, where it seems to go really well, other kids who are really going to struggle. So if I'm using a better method than another teacher, it's not like all my kids are going to learn how to read and all of the other teacher's kids aren't going to learn how to read. So the data that I as a teacher am seeing are kind of murky. 
And if I've been a teacher for 10 years and I've been using this method and I've seen lots of kids come out of my classroom looking pretty successful to me, along comes little Dan with his, you know, theory about reading and he's never taught anybody to read in his life. Like, why in the world would you believe me, right? This really seems hazardous to change your practice. So in the 60s, after uh, Jean Charles' book came out, very little changed. Uh, and, and the reading wars really have not ended. We're now, you know, in 2021. And I think it's, I think in the U.S., there are more teachers who buy into the idea. Yeah, when you're teaching kids to decode, letter sound correspondences really uh, are helpful. It's not like uh, every curriculum that districts are buying are terrific in, uh, uh, in, in offering support to teachers in doing that. So in a lot of districts, you have kind of a mishmash of different methods, and we could get more into it if you want to about sort of what uh, a little bit about the, the reading politics around this. But I, I think you you get the idea of what the controversy is. And, and as you asked, why it is that everyone doesn't just listen to the science. Yeah, and it seems to continually, you know, go through these cycles where people start to, uh, you, you know, bring back old discredited ideas. But but it seems to me when, when you look at some of the things that you highlight as most essential things that we know work. For instance, you know, what you call scaffolding or, you know, the need for practice or the need for feedback. You know, when I read through those things, I think, well, that just is so obvious and it makes sense, but it makes sense most to me when I put myself in the position of, of the learner. I mean, is it that teachers have forgotten what it's like to be a learner? Because when you when you are a learner, like it, it makes perfect sense that you would start with the rudiments and then, you know, work your way up and that you would, you know, engage in, in repeated uh, attempts at, to, to try and solve things and, and that you would, uh, you know, want to know, are you making progress or not, right, before, you know, you've completed the task. Um, as a learner, those just seem so obvious. Do you think that, that teachers... Uh, sort of stop learning at some point or they, they stop remembering what it's like to be a learner. Um, they lose empathy for the, for the, for the learner. Is, is that a possible explanation for kind of losing track of these seemingly obvious um, insights? I don't, I don't think that's it because I, I think, I think t teachers have enormous empathy for kids and they're around kids all the time. And so I think, much better than most people, they they really know where kids' heads are at and what they're thinking about. I think a, I think a bigger problem is sometimes some of the some of the things that are um, uh, when it comes to reading are pretty arcane. You know, you start getting into uh, particulars of um, different phoneme groups and the ordering and the the sequencing in which. Uh, that sort of instruction should happen. And again, a, a part of it comes down to sort of what materials do you have av uh, available to you? You know, for most teachers, they're not in charge of the reading curriculum. Uh, they're not the ones who are making purchasing decisions. Someone at the district level is doing that. So they they sort of are handed these materials and they uh, it's not like they bring nothing to the table in terms of using the materials, but the materials either support or don't support practices. And then the other thing is I've, I've already mentioned, like you're gonna have a lot of variability in your classroom. So we may see that, you know, Greg is doing great and Greg is, uh, really knows how to read. Greg doesn't need that much more practice on this. Dan does, right? Dan's got a real problem. So now I gotta figure out how am I gonna give Dan more practice? And frankly, Dan doesn't really wanna do this because he knows damn well he's not very good at it. And he's really resistant to, you know, spending all day practicing stuff he's no good at. Um, so how am I going to get him to practice more without completely killing his motivation? It's another thing that, um, you know, first grade teachers are really going to be thinking about. I don't want Dan to leave here and hate reading and, you know, finish first grade thinking this is all there is to reading is feeling shame and doing stuff that I that I find really hard. Meanwhile, Greg is over here doing great. So what do you know, do I just send him over to a corner read by himself and don't give him any instruction? That's not very cool. So they've, they've got you know, real challenges, um, and especially given the emphasis, you know, so little is emphasized in these early grade classrooms other than decoding. And that really is due to state mandates. Like there's no, um, you know, nothing is tested except reading and math. 
And so uh, this is how science gets crowded out, social studies gets crowded out, because administrators in particular know that their tenure is really um, uh, sort of lives or dies by how kids do on, uh, on standardized tests. Well, I mean, it seems like if, stand, if, if we have a very standardized, simple to measure um, kind of output objective, then this seems like something that in today's world with all the technology we have, um, this should be something that, that all these disputes should just disappear because if we have individual test takers who are going through some individual journey um, that's potentially customizable, uh, then we can just use analytics to, to figure out what works and, and then even customize it down to the individual level. I mean, if you look at Facebook uh, or, you know, they're able to create a news feed that, that optimizes engagement. I'm not saying, I mean, that's not the objective we're interested in, but, but um, you know, they, they just AB test the has the AB test the crap out of every possible permutation of your news feed to keep you engaged. Or, you know, if we look at what video game companies can do, I mean, they, 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 they know exactly how to keep people, um, engaged for, you know, almost an infinite amount of time. Do you think that, that some of these controversies and some of these problems will, would just go away if, if we, um, move to a, a world where every single piece of the educational journey was, was being tracked and, uh, and manipulated and AB tested? So I think three or four years ago, there were a lot of people who thought that that vision was, was going to come to pass. And I think people are, much less optimistic about it than they were. Um, the uh, uh, without without getting into details, there was a, a prominent uh, uh, technology and education person who uh, sent around an email that got forwarded quite a lot. That uh, in which he said, you know, the the idea was that we were going to come up with this algorithm, and the algorithm was going to be tapped into a database of knowledge and questions, you know, sort of uh, materials that would guide you, uh, that would guide you through the sort of optimal pathway. An algorithm would tell me the optimal pathway and everybody would learn. And what we figured out is that we don't really have the algorithm. Um, but even worse, what we really don't have is this big database. And we haven't populated it with materials. And that's a very old problem. So there's a chapter um, that I uh, that I like to quote that's from 2001, I think, which is basically how uh, the theme of the chapter is what went wrong with with computer based learning. So in the, the what you just described, people were saying was going to happen in the 80s. Uh, and that's when if for a medium sized district, they could afford a, a mainframe computer and dummy terminals and everyone thought every you know this 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 is how this is how learning is going to work in the future uh, and what it presupposes the the um, assumption that people were making is there's sort of an endless supply of good and interesting materials to present to kids so in other words i you present me with fractions uh, how to add fractions and i don't understand it okay well then we have a branching um, you know, logic diagram, and Dan gets another presentation of addition of fraction. Well, wait a minute, who wrote that? What What are you going to show, Dan? Writing those materials is no small matter. Um, so, you know, as you said, like, can't we just A, B the hell out of this? Where's the A and where's the B? That's the problem. Uh, that's one of the problems. So right now, people, and then the pandemic has made people even more cynical about any of this working because it's really brought home. People don't like sitting in front of screens mm -hmm. all the time. You know, it's not, it's not as, it's not like the movies, like the movies kind of killed live theater. The, the screens don't seem to be killing live teaching. Well, but on the other hand, people do like to sit in front of video games for endless hours. And, and yeah. if you put a, four-year-old in front of, um, you know, Roblox or, or uh, Minecraft. I mean, they, they figure out pretty darn quickly how to, you know, build a castle or whatever uh, without any immediate instruction from, from, from a human. So, so couldn't yes. we uh, imagine, I mean, maybe the, the reason why remote learning is, is, is so unpopular is because it was, we're taking something that was designed for one environment and we're just kind of dragging and dropping it into a different environment. But if we rethought the entire yeah. methodology and, and, and optimized it for the delivery channel, it might be very different. 
that's well put. I like that that drag and drop uh, uh, turn of phrase you use. So yeah, I mean, pe- there have been plenty of people working furiously on that idea as well. Um, and th- the difficulty is, I think people underestimate the specificity of learning. So Minecraft's a great example. Like, can you learn perimeter and area through Minecraft? Sure. I mean, that that's pretty straightforward because that it, it's really well suited to learn that. But the broader idea, like you're learning teamwork if you're working with other kids to build something, you really aren't necessarily. I mean, or if you are, you might be learning teamwork in the specific environment in which you're in. Um, learning is, I mean, f- so give you the, the example where we have the most data on this is chess. Russia, Soviet Union for years taught everybody chess because they thought it was going to make everybody smart. Uh, and we don't have their data because they haven't, uh, the Soviet <laughs> Union never released it. Um, but we do have data from U.S. school systems. Chess doesn't make you smart. Chess makes you good at chess. Um, and so that's that transfer problem is is a big problem in gaming. If you want to teach kids math, they actually really need to do math. And there are ways like the like the perimeter and area example um, where you can you can build mathematical problems into the environment. But the more general idea that people were hoping and, and you, that you actually still hear pitched a lot for gaming um, seems to be much less broadly true. I'm actually interviewing Tom Vanderbilt uh, later this week, and he wrote a book called Beginners, and, and he talks about chess and his daughter's learning chess. And 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 one of the points that, that comes up there is, um, you know, is there this this general uh, ability to learn that you can teach, or this um, uh, critical reasoning? I mean, I, I remember um, uh, I started teaching our MBAs a, a critical thinking kind of workshop. Uh, uh, when they first show up to teach them the basics of logic and inference and so forth. Yeah. And I think in a lot of our classes, like I teach a course in statistics uh, and, it, and uh, courses on data science, the idea is, well, you don't really need to remember how to do a decision tree, but you do need to understand kind of problems of bias and, and, uh, and, you know, these, these abstract concepts. Um, could you talk a bit about uh, learning how to learn as opposed to learning specific content? And can you take that and transfer it from one area to another? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is uh, not very well, um, certainly not when you, uh, but it's it's more complicated than that, as you would expect. So uh, take the simplest case first. Um, when you first learn new content, it really does kind of cling to the examples that in which you first learn it. And so every teacher and most students have experienced this. You know, you you learn about something we just said perimeter. So you you learn how to calculate perimeter in um, in Minecraft. And then, you know, out in the wild, you encounter something where the idea of perimeter comes up, but you know, you're no longer in Minecraft. It just doesn't occur to you that you're looking at the same thing. That's a very, very consistent finding. Same thing is true when you talk about logic. So you can teach people modus tollens and they get it, but that doesn't mean they're gonna recognize it out in the wild very readily. Um, If you practice with enough, um, uh, so psychologists call it deep structure versus surface structure. So you've got modus tollens can take can take on lots of different forms, and that's the surface structure. Are we talking about coins, or are we talking about eggs, or whatever it is? Initially, when I see a problem about eggs, I just start thinking, what do I know about eggs? And I'm thinking about hens, and I'm thinking about baking cakes. I'm not necessarily thinking about modus tollens or about uh, correlation is not causation, or about Newton's third law. The problem is all of these deep structures are about functional relationship among the elements. And it's sort of invisible in the problem, right? Um, But it's obviously about eggs in some sense. So that's where my memory goes. And it's only when I've seen that functional relationship among elements in many different surface structures that it kind of jumps out to me. Oh, that this is one of those problems. Now that said, so one thing is, yeah, with lots and lots of practice, you get you get much better at transfer. The second thing is, well, is it then worth teaching people these abstract principles? And the answer is, yeah, it is. It's worth teaching people um, things like you tend to be biased. All of us tend to be biased so that we will 
kind of go through this mental checklist and think to ourselves, um, could I be biased in this way? Could I be, you know, sort of try it on for size? This is generally called metacognition. It's like encouraging people to think about thinking. And the analogy I give is, um, it's sort of like, imagine you come home with uh, a piece of furniture from Ikea and you get out the instructions and it says, think about other pieces of furniture mm -hmm. you've constructed in the past and like every now and then stop and look at it. Does it look like it's turning into a piece of furniture? Like these are actually not bad ideas. Like it does make sense to do that, but they're not sufficient. You need right. to know piece A goes into piece B and that's like problem specific. Um, so metacognition is that sort of think about thinking and it's good. It's just, it's not enough. So I always wonder why, why don't we have courses say in, in JDM or even just in, in statistics and inference uh, at, at a much younger level? Uh, you know, I find students come into late twenties into a business school and this is the first time they've encountered, you know, basic statistical reasoning or, or inference yeah. or, um, you know, first time they've been exposed to biases and heuristics. Like this seems like some kind of stuff that could be learned very early on. Or are you saying that maybe you need to have uh, some domain knowledge to, to, to make it stick? Um, you know, in statistics, we talk about there's statistics for biology and there's statistics for psychology and there's statistics for business. And, and yeah. if the examples don't resonate with you, then you're really, it's just too abstract to really stick. Well, I, I don't think that I don't think that's the problem, uh, because, you know, if you could find you could find examples that would make sense to high schoolers that and they it would stick um, because, you know, it is it is all around us. I think the problem first, first of all, I think it it's probably better than when I was in high school. I mean, when I was in high school, I really think it probably didn't exist much at all. Certainly it didn't for me and my sense is it didn't. And now I think it it is making its way into more curricular. Uh, but curricula are really slow to change, you know, I mean, you know, telling people like maybe we should drop trig and then, you know, there's always someone who stands up at the school right. board me. How can you think about, you know, right? The most so, useless uh, course I ever took, by the way. I, I know. <laughs> I know. It's, it's like it, it, it's always trig is always the whipping, you know, whipping board, right. whatever the right expression is. You know, that's what the one that people always say is no good. Um, but you'll still have its defenders, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, hey, Latin, so, yeah. Latin, Latin, Latin wound up, we wound up getting rid of Latin at some point, although I, I took Latin too. Did you? Yeah. That, and, and that, that didn't come easy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, getting rid of Latin. So, um, yeah, so I don't know what some, it would make sense if something would go before something else would come in, but you know, I, I, I fully agree with you. Um, but curriculum's a curriculum is a tough, a tough subject. So uh, this book on trusting the experts, right? I mean, this was really addressed towards teachers and helping them to evaluate yeah. different different kinds of of you know, teaching interventions, and and then even for parents who are trying to you know figure out because parents are really responsible, I think probably for at least as much teaching, if not more teaching than than teachers, and they certainly don't have any kind of training in in teaching, um, you know, parenting and. You know, there's books on parenting and there's lots of gimmicks and, and promises out there yeah. for becoming a good parent or becoming a, a good teacher. Um, we, we live in a time when I think experts are uh, maybe under attack, should we say? Uh, yeah. are there, the, the lessons of this book, I think, go well beyond teachers. And even though it's 10 years after the book was published, um, what is it about experts, why are people so, so bad at, at evaluating uh, expertise? Um, and, and why is it that uh, people who purport to be experts oftentimes get just as much credence as people who actually are experts? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the problems are obviously related, right? So if I, if I have a lot of trouble figuring out who's an expert, then I'm easily fall prey to people who claim to be an expert. And I think the reason is that uh, once you get out of co a content area that you know anything about, you have to fall back not on expertise, you know, really, you can't really evaluate the expertise. So you fall back on marks of expertise, sort of earmarks of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think those are, are fairly easy to fake, um, especially in profession, professions where there's no licensing going on. So I think in the book, I give the example, you know, I, I trust people all the time 
uh, without a whole lot of reason, right? So, you know, someone, I had an architect who put together plans for a deck for my backyard. Like, I, how do I know this person knew what the heck they were doing? Or an electrician comes into my house. You know, I don't really know whether or not they know what they're doing. But in truth, like for both of those, they're, they're, you, you can't practice unless you have a license. So unless they're breaking the law, they have been licensed by the state. Now, have I looked into that deeply? No, but I, uh, I sort of don't have any reason to doubt that it's a problem. Similarly with my physician, mm -hmm. I don't have much reason to doubt that the licensing process is a problem. But when it comes to education, there's not a licensing process. Um, and anybody can claim to be an expert in matters of education and a whole lot of people do. Um, and so what they do is they sort of uh, appropriate other sorts of earmarks of expertise and they talk about fancy degrees they have, they talk about appearances they've made on television and books that they write, the kinds of things that we assume that experts do. Um, and if you don't have anything else to go on, then okay, you know, there's that and then there's my gut feeling as to whether or not um, what they say makes sense. And that, of course, if someone is out to pick your pocket, that's what they're extremely careful about is coming up with a message that makes sense and that people will um, uh, want to hear. But it seems like there are some general rules that you can use, uh, even if your domain expertise is, is quite shallow. So, you know, as an ordinary person and you, you, you hear a claim on, on TV from a Dr. Phil or a Dr. Oz about, you know, eat these magic pills and your life will be perfect. Uh, I mean, it, it, it seems pretty easy to kind of say, all right, well, let's, where's, where's the footnote, you know, where's the study, yeah. where's the report, where's the research and, um, and, and, you know, follow that trail just to, just to find out whether or not it, it makes sense. Now, obviously you're not going to do this for trivial, um, claims, but for things like how you live and how you eat and how you, uh, raise your kids and so forth. It, it seems like a relatively small um, a, a amount of work for for something that has yeah. profound consequences. Um, isn't this a skill that you can you can acquire uh, at at a at a relatively high level? Uh, I like to say to my MBA students, look, you should be able to read a, an article in Nature or Science and 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 get the basic gist and see if the methodology seems legit and so forth rather than just reading yeah. the conclusion. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, well, it's in nature, so it must be true, but, right. but you, can, you can still, as an ordinary citizen scientist, dig deeper to see if, if it really is something you ought to rely on. And I think one of the big things, I, I, I tend to agree, and I mean, that's, that was what I was trying to do in the book, and, and even more in the book, I was, I was sort of assuming, you're probably not gonna read journal articles in Science and Nature because you're not an academic and you're not gonna get those you don't have access to those free and they're very expensive as you know um, to read journal articles so I was trying to make it where you know you you um, you don't have access to that material but I think I think you can come up with some general principles which are not going to be foolproof by any means but they'll offer some protection and so to me like the first thing to do is just to ask the question that you asked you say that it's proven can you show me some evidence that it's proven that in in the world of education that cuts out about 80 percent of mm. the claims that are made because you know most of the time there there just isn't any um and then after that you can get the other thing that i really encourage is like the sniff test really matters you know like does does this even make sense to you you know if it's if it seems like a miracle cure if you're talking about like uh, i've figured out how mm. to uh, cure dyslexia or kids who were, you know, uh, struggling in math, I can get them three grade levels over the course of a summer. Like that seems really unbelievable. And in truth, like if it did happen, if there's a, first of all, you should be really suspicious of breakthroughs. Uh, if there is a breakthrough, they happen very, very infrequently in science. If you know anything about the history of science, you know, breakthroughs don't happen. They have uh, quickly, they happen. What looks like a breakthrough in retrospect actually was a slow building process. And you'll hear about it like on the front page of the Washington Post. You won't hear about it on a website with a money back guarantee. So there's a handful of principles like that you can use. It's, it is hard though, because I mean, especially if 
your child uh, is struggling in school, you know, you are really vulnerable because you are you are a desperate parent. Now, I've been working with a lot of ed tech uh, startups and, and the claims that a lot of them are making now, uh, which I find compelling, is that um, the educational system that we all know and love was really designed to crank out kind of factory workers and, and um, you know, uh, kind of paper pushers and uh, essentially tasks that you learn once and you can kind of amortize over 45 years. Um, and that's not the world we live in, right? We need to be training people to be continuous learners. We need to train them to be become lifelong uh, students. Uh, and so we need to teach them how to teach themselves. Uh, and, and, uh, and this requires a, a radically different type of, of, of education. Um, is, is that something that, that resonates with you? Uh, and, and if so, would, what would the implications be for, for how we, we need to, um, adjust the, the kind of classroom environment, uh, going forward? I'm, I'm just full disclosure. Yeah. I was a Montessori, uh, student in my first until about fourth grade. And then it was when I hit fourth grade, it was, it was a, it was an absolute, um, culture shock to me. I, I just could not yeah. believe that I had to sit in this little desk and listen to someone. And I, and I kept trying to, I kept, where's my, my button where I can put my teacher on like, you know, three X. It, it didn't, it didn't, right. didn't work. <laughs> so I was usually kind of the, the person down here with the book under the desk. Um, uh, so what, 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 how do things have to change uh, and, and in what direction? So, well, so, since you offered that disclosure, I'll offer my disclosure. My wife is a Montessorian and both of my children uh, who attend school now attend, uh, attended Montessori school up through grade eight and would have gone to a Montessori high school if there were one in town. Um, so, and, and, but getting back to the, the, so I'm not a historian of education, but my friends who are historians say that the, the, um, the factory worker business is, is sort of overdone. I mean, I think that the uh, it is not representative of sort of American education. American education is very decentralized, and the idea that there were, uh, you know, a couple of at the time, old, you know, uh, white guys with ponches smoking cigars and figuring, you know, coming up with a mastermind plan for education throughout the forty-eight uh, contiguous states is not very realistic. We were extremely decentralized uh, since its inception. That said, uh, there's no doubt the labor market has changed and uh, the, the idea that we're preparing kids for a different um, job environment certainly makes sense. In terms of what, what needs to change, like the, you know, you hear this uh, a lot under the moniker 21st century skills that kids today just need, they need to be able to collaborate, they need to uh, critical thinking. Basically, there are many more jobs, this is work by Richard Murnane at Harvard, that there are many more jobs today that require cognitive work that is not repetitive. So, you know, 50 years ago, you were an accountant, you were doing cognitive work, it was kind of the same thing over and over again. And most of the jobs today require much more nimble thinking, changeable situation. From a cognitive perspective, this the sad truth is what, what we need to do is what we've been doing. It's just we need to do it better and kids need to get farther along. So this relates to the topic we were talking about a few minutes ago about transfer and the extent to which you can teach um, high level thinking sort of completely domain free. And there's, you know, people have been working at that forever. People cared about critical thinking 100 years ago as much as we care about it now. And people were as frustrated by the, the sort of emphasis on memorization and mm -hmm. fact learning uh, as much then as they are as we are now. Uh, the, the truth is that the stubborn cognitive fact is the facts are easier to learn. Uh, the first thing you learn in a domain is the simple facts. You learn the definitions. Part of it is it's just much more obvious to you. Someone uses a vocabulary word and you don't know what that word is. That really stands out to you. If you say two things um, and I understand each of them and in your mind they connect, I may miss the connection and be completely oblivious to the fact that I've missed the connection. In your mind, that's the really good stuff. That's the rich stuff, right? This is what happens when college professors give lectures. What they find is the students are getting all the little factoids and they're missing the high level structure. The high level structure is harder. 
right? It's much easier to memorize facts and it's much easier to know what it is you're supposed to learn. So this is a natural first step of learning. This principle goes down to grade one. You know, if we want our kids to be better critical thinkers, we just need to do what we've been doing better. So in, in machine learning, there's this idea of the learning curve, right? So when you're trying to get better at classifying, the you want to look at examples that are very, very different, right? So if you're just looking at the same picture of the cat and the same picture of the dog over and over again, it's not going to really yeah. improve your predictions out in the field. So you can actually design a, um, you know, a data set that, that focuses on the things right around uh, the, the edge. Um, the name of this podcast is Unsiloed, and, and the idea is that, you know, uh, you can, in today's world, the, 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 the optimal learning curve may well uh, force you to go farther afield than you might have uh, in earlier times where uh, transfer from one domain to the other is, is, it was less important. Um, do, you, do you see, do you see um, in that sense, people have the capacity to get what we might think of as, as, as smarter, right? Uh, we, we, we observe that IQs have, have increased over time when you go from kind of rural traditional areas to, to more developed areas, the, these, these measures of abstract reasoning are, are, you know, are better. I mean, of course, there's gotta be something that's given up presumably. I mean, you can't track, I can't track a kangaroo through the, through the savanna anymore, but, but I can, I can, I can do this kind of abstract reasoning is, 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 is our educational system really optimized for helping people to, to learn these, these so-called, you know, general intelligence type of, uh, of, of tasks? Uh, probably not, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, if someone came to me and said, you've got free reign to do whatever you want to optimize for general intelligence, go. I think I would probably say, here's your money back because I really, uh, I don't think I or anybody else knows exactly how to optimize. Um, I think that there, there, there's certainly room for improvement. Um, uh, and, you know, thinking about, um, sort of, you know, one indication I thought, and, and you froze for a moment. So I don't know if you mentioned the Flynn effect or whether yeah. I sort of substitute, you did mention the Flynn mm -hmm. effect. Yeah. So, you know, that, and that, that's less a, that, that may be a question of schooling, but it's probably more a question of the environment more broadly. Um, this is something, this is something else that we could really think about, which I think, um, policymakers aren't thinking about enough is ways of enriching the environment more generally and offering families and kids more choices of things they could do outside of school that would be cognitively challenging and that kids would find rewarding because kids spend a lot of time in school, but they also spend a lot of time outside of mm -hmm. school. Um, and that's very important to thinking as well. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the impact of the last year. Um, you know, there are a lot of economists that have done studies that showed the impact of, say, a year of lost learning. Um, yeah. There are others that say, well, you know, maybe it's not completely lost, right? Because there's so much on online education. But certainly in large parts of the world, like in India, for instance, um, most students have not had any kind of education at all online yeah. or, or, or in person. Um, so I'm wondering if you could reflect on that and then um, at the same time, maybe uh, uh, comment on, um, you know, some of the science. I, I mean, I'm, I'm always I'm a little perplexed at how uh, readily uh, so many of our, our teachers have um, uh, accepted ideas around safety that don't seem to be grounded in any kind of uh, science. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't, not because they're, they're bad learners or in bad faith, but, but there seems to be a lot of expertise that's been circulating that, that may, uh, may be, maybe erroneous. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? I mean, just this whole past year sure. has been such a, such a crazy, crazy situation. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the learning loss, uh, you know, I, I, I think it is a, it is a cause of significant concern. Um, I had a, uh, an op-ed that uh, sort of made the rounds. Actually, there were a lot of people who did not want to hear this. Maybe it was just a crappy op-ed, uh, but I usually don't have so much trouble placing op-eds. It did, uh, the uh, New York Daily News eventually took it. 
Um, but the, the point of the op-ed was, yeah, I mean, the, you know, we actually have really good data that we know what happens when you don't go to school for a year, which is you're not as smart as you could have been. I mean, going to school literally raises your IQ. This isn't conjecture. Like we have really good data from a number of different sources. There are kids who get sick for a year and can't go to school. There are Kid, you know, whole district shut down because of flu for a while. And I think so there's forth. life expectancy consequences as well, right? Uh, there's bound to be because I mean that there's life, there's life expect the relationship between IQ and life expectancy is 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 pretty robust. So it, you know, it's it's a pretty broad range, but the estimate is something like anywhere between one and five IQ points for each year that you're in school. Now, a lot of kids have not just completely in the U.S. have not completely missed school, but they've missed a lot, and there's there's definitely a lot of variation in um, how much they've gotten out of remote learning related to their home environment, related to you know their past experiences with school, the tech that's available, all the rest of it. Upshot is we got a lot of kids who. Um, have really missed out this year. And what I emphasize in this op-ed was the economic consequences. And this was work from uh, a couple of Stanford economists uh, that they undertook at the behest of the OECD. Uh, and they were looking not just at the consequences for individual kids, which exist, um, you know, and probably amounts to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of lifetime income on average, but also for the U.S. economy as a whole. So there's there's a lot of um, a lot of this work on the relationship of co cognitive skills and economic productivity. So a lot of this work has used OECD measures, um, uh, international measures of cognitive skills, and then. Uh, looked at the consequences for the economy as kids come into the workforce. So most of the testing takes place when they're 15. And then you look in future years at what happens to economic productivity and their data, you know, mm. for 40, 50, 80 countries, depending on the year. Um, and the relationship is pretty robust. And so the uh, they end up estimating that you're you're looking at probably 10, 15 trillion dollars over the course of the next several decades in terms of lost productivity. So you have concern for individual kids and then concern for the economy as a whole. Um, so that that to me is pretty grave and indicates we we really ought to try and do something about that. Uh, what I suggested is everybody ought to go to summer school. I think nobody really liked that idea very much, but it's really what the way I described it is what I still believe is there aren't any choices you're going to like. Like you can do nothing, but you know, and that that's not going to hurt right now. But in future decades, it's going to hurt these kids. It's going to hurt your kids and your grandkids. Or you can like bite the bullet and do something terrible, like go to summer school this summer and try and mitigate the damage. And, and I think this is disparate in terms of its impact. Uh, most here in the Bay Area, most of the wealthy people have been getting their their kids have been getting educated, and the yeah. uh, folks that they're less wealthy have not been getting educated. Um, why do you suppose this? I mean, if, with the impact that large, why do you suppose that kind of hasn't entered into the cost benefit? Um, calculations is it is it just that it's not well understood or is it that you know teachers themselves don't understand it and haven't really been uh at the forefront of the of the discussion or that the teachers are generally their opinions are are undervalued or i mean just based on your understanding of how expertise makes its way into the kind of public domain yeah. what 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 do you think the the issue is I mean, this is a policy matter, and I, you know, the, I'm I'm no expert on policy. My my, but briefly, my sense is there are a couple of pieces. One is that um, very few people have any appetite to do anything about this, just because everyone just feels completely beaten down by the pandemic, and this has been this has been so hard. I think I don't think parents want to do this. I don't think t very few teachers have any interest at all in teaching this summer because they're so exhausted from this year. And I mentioned, you know, my wife's a teacher and she hasn't even been teaching full time. And this is exhausting for her trying to do this. Um, but parents don't want it either. Parents, you know, to the extent they can, parents want a normal summer. Like we want to, you know, do some, the summer things and eat popsicles and stuff. We don't want to take my kid to school. It sounds awful, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big part of it. And the other thing is I think to the extent that people do think about the economics of it, um, the people who are in positions of power might do something about it, think my kid's going to be fine. 
because they they're thinking about the they think of education as an economic benefit and and it's pretty much a zero sum game to the extent that my kids educated my kid is a bigger slice of the economic yeah. pie my kid seems to be doing okay so i'm not and even if they're not no one's doing okay so you know no harm no foul but as i mentioned like education makes the pie grow bigger it it increases economic productivity so it it is sort of um something that everybody ought to be thinking about well dan thanks so much for for joining me today um these these books are are fantastic and and you have a new book coming out outsmart your brain could you just give us a little bit of a a, a brief um teaser for that for that book i would love to thanks for asking greg so this this book is uh, here's the simple premise when uh kindergartners uh are trying are, are learning um our expectation is close to zero and appropriately so for how much the kindergartner will bring to the table so to speak in terms of regulating their own learning you don't like your kid doesn't come home from kindergarten and you don't say like look i my your teacher tells me you're not really taking finger painting very seriously i mean, don't you think it's time you kind of buckle down and and you know got, got you know got serious about this mister whereas you know by the time kids graduate high school our expectations are very high for their ability to regulate their own learning we think they should know how to focus attention even if they don't feel like it we think they should know how to commit things to memory they should know how to deal with test anxiety uh, there's a long list of things they should be able to do, but they're not ha taught how to do any of this. And we know they're not taught because we've surveyed college students and asked them, were you ever taught how to study and so forth? And over 80% say no. Um, interestingly, most of them come up with the same strategies, which are, you know, they got to do something, right? They can't just say like, well, no one's taught me how to study, so I'm not mm -hmm. studying. So they come up with something. Um, and they mostly come up with the same ideas. And the reason they come up with the same ideas is they come up with stuff that feels like it's working at the time. And that also doesn't seem like real arduous and real difficult, uh, which makes sense, right? They're trying to learn efficiently. Um, and this is why the book is called Outsmart Your Brain, because your brain leads you to solutions to these self-regulation problems that actually don't work very well. They feel like they're working at the time. The analogy I give at the front end of the book is this is this is one instance where um, an analogy to exercise in your brain actually makes sense. Frequently they don't. But if you're trying to learn how to do as many push-ups as you can, you can practice push-ups, right? But even better would be to practice really difficult push-ups, like where the ones where you launch yourself off the floor and clap. Um, but those, imagine me telling you to do that. And then your reaction is, damn, this is stupid. Like, I can't do any of these. I'm trying to learn how to do good, you know, do a lot of push-ups. You're making me do these terrible push-ups. I can't do any of these, right? But look at this, Dan. I do push-ups on my knees. I can do lots of push-ups on my knees. This is fantastic, right? And so this is why kids veer towards all the same strategies. They're doing the mental equivalent of push-ups on their knees. It's both easy and it feels like things are going great. But in the long run, it's really not the best exercise for your mind. So the feedback mechanism is not the right one that they're responding to. Exactly. And that's that's one of the things that I talk about in the book is how can you get uh, valid feedback for how your learning is going? Well, that's fascinating. I, I look forward to uh, I look forward to reading it. I know that when I'm teaching in my business school classes, I, I try to impart some suggestions on how to best prepare and study. And oftentimes they're they're not the ones that students are, are using. I usually tell them to study in groups. I tell them to explain things to each other um, and then interrogate each other and, and turn it into a kind of a social uh, experience. Um, and many of them, you know, hadn't thought to do that, uh, but it seems to work very well. Um, so thanks again. I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll chat again and I look forward to reading the book as soon as it comes out. Thanks, Greg. It's fun being here. Thank you. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.